Welcome everybody, my name's Keith Golding. I'm chairing uh, this afternoon's webinar and delighted to welcome Mick Crawley to talk to us about the Silwood Park long-term field experiments. Uh, many of us, I suspect, know Mick very well, but I will give a, a brief introduction for those of you who don't know him. So uh, Mick was one of the first cohort of undergraduates to study ecology as a degree subject, and that was at the University of Edinburgh way back in 1967 to 70. And interestingly enough, he had to learn how to program computers at that time. Now, I had that too, uh, but that was because I was on a maths and chemistry course. So unusual, I would have thought, for an ecology student to have to learn programming. But he did, and it came in useful later. Uh, he did, Mick did his PhD at Silwood Park on plant herbivore interactions and obtained that in 1973 and then got his first job as a lecturer in ecology in a brand new course on environmental science at the University of Bradford, which gave him the opportunity to cram each year of degree course with field courses. So uh, instilling the importance of an in-depth knowledge of natural history in the students, as well as uh, lots of lectures. He returned to Silwood Park in 1979 as a lecturer in entomology, but because he was uh, foolish enough to learn computing, he was hired to teach statistics and computing to undergraduates, masters and PhD students. Uh, but um, computing in those days, of course, was punch cards and paper tape, rather different from what it is now. So Mick ended his salary career at Silwood as Professor of Plant Ecology and as Campus Dean, and that was in 2014. But he reckons that since then, he's gone into work more often than anyone on the paid staff. So well done, Mick, for keeping involved and committed. And of course, he continues his long-term field research in an emeritus capacity. So we're delighted to hear from Mick today. Uh, just to say to all of you, please keep your videos off and stay muted and ask any questions through the chat function. You can do that throughout the talk. So as soon as you think of something, please put it on the chat. And Ben Sykes, our executive director, will be keeping an eye on the chat uh, and he will ask the questions at the end of the talk. So he'll be able to perhaps put them together if they follow a, a similar topic. If he thinks it's appropriate, then Ben will ask you to unmute, to ask the question and talk to Mick directly yourselves. But unless he does, please stay muted. So Mick, thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us. And we look forward to hearing from you about the long-term experiments at Silwood Park. Over to you. Right, so here we are and everything's working, which is excellent. So welcome to Silwood. Here we are just west of London in the green belt, right on the extreme eastern edge of Berkshire, on the Atlantic fringe. So although we're 51.4 degrees north, we're very temperate here in terms of the climate. So it's a dry part of England. We get about 680 millimeters of rain a year. And Silwood is on largely acidic sandy soils of the Bagshot series. So before agriculture, what we think um, was the vegetation was a mosaic of Quercus robo woodland and uh, lowland heath, looking quite open, we suspect, with quite big herbivore impacts. After 1066, William the Conqueror moved out of Oxford very wisely and moved into Windsor, right next door to Silwood Park. And from then on, Silwood was part of the favoured a royal hunting forest, which is the main reason why the park stays today as rural as it does. So enclosure in our part of Berkshire happened towards the end of the 18th century, when a large number of very wealthy people built big houses in landscape grounds. And Silwood was no different from this. The first house was in grounds landscape by the famous Humphrey Repton. So the most important thing, I think, to understand about the ecology of Silwood is the vital role that rabbits have played uh, in the recent past. So they, they're clearly the keystone species. And let me show you why I say that. This black and white photograph is the view 
uh, from the front of Silwood that appeared in the estate agent's brochure last time Silwood Park was sold as a private residence in the 1930s. And those of you familiar with Silwood will recognize the sharp edge of the ha-ha there in the foreground. And in 1930, you could see from the manor house all the way to Ascot. So the grassland was unbroken from Silwood to Ascot, about two kilometers, studded with these beautiful veteran oaks. And in 1953, myxomatosis was introduced illegally, remember, from France, having come from Brazil. And rabbits basically disappeared for about 20 years. All of those open areas in the last photograph were maintained, we think, by rabbit grazing. And the present view from that same spot in the manor house now looks like this. There's an unbroken line of naturally regenerated woodland right across that view. So everything which is not mowed is now woodland. And then Far distance, that, that exclamation mark in silver, that's a Rothamsted suction trap, which I'll talk about in a minute. And you'll notice that the veteran oaks have gone. The last one to go is lying on its side there in the middle of the view. That's, we leave it as a memorial to the great storm of October 1987. By the early 1970s, Young oaks were colonizing previously maintained rabbit grassland. You can see in the center right of this picture, this old black and white picture from my PhD years, you can see young sapling oaks beginning to colonize that slope. And canopy closure took just 15 years, so now it's completely dominated by um, birch, oak, elm, woodland. Now, as you probably know, the Myxoma virus became less virulent through evolution, and rabbits became much more resistant, again, through evolution. And rabbit numbers recovered to their former levels by the late 1970s, by which time, of course, the woodland was completely indestructible. But as you can see from this picture, rabbits still continue to have an enormous impact on the ecology of the woodland, despite the fact that they were no longer um, stopping regeneration. You can see that with rabbits in the foreground and on the left, the forest floor looks as if the vegetation has been completely shaded out. But of course, it's not the case. What's happened, the rabbit fence shows clearly that without the rabbits, the woodland would be carpeted in grass. The biggest impact of rabbits, though, was in the grasslands of Silwood. And here, this picture from 1994 shows you that in the rabbit grazed areas in the bottom right, all grass flowering had been stopped by the intensity of grazing. Where the rabbits are excluded, the grasses have gone to seed and are now sort of California straw colored in summer. So this shows that the best data we've got for the national decline of rabbits. Since about the mid 90s, they've, they've probably declined about 60% over England as a whole. But I reckon for Silwood, the decline is much more severe than that. More like an 80% decline since the mid 90s. This is what silver grasslands look like today. Well, last week, actually. There's virtually no measurable rabbit impact anymore. That silver object in the foreground is a rabbit exclusion cage, and there's just as much grass outside as there is inside. So that's a massive change. And that draws attention to the first general point I want to make about long-term studies is that if they're long-term, th th they will often span very big ecological changes. In Silwood's case, this involved a second virtual disappearance of a keystone herbivore. The first one, of course, was caused by myxoma, which was introduced in 1953. But the current one is the, the decline is due to rabbit hemorrhagic disease, which was first mentioned in 1992. But the present one is quite different genetically from that original 1992 RHDV. These, these classic RHD viruses mutate very, very quickly. And the new one, the current one, RHDV2, was first sequenced in 2020. And that sequencing showed that it probably didn't evolve from the original one. It's an, it's an independent introduction. So let me tell you now about the current field studies that are going on at Silwood. 
Before I go into detail about the ones that we've been looking at for a long time, I just want to introduce you to two new ones that you yourselves might be interested in joining. They're a wonderful um, way for uh, young scientists to get involved in joint publications. These are two very productive studies. The first one is called NutNet, and there are two sites at Silverwood that have been there since 2008. This is a, a very simple experiment repeated globally with a factorial addition of three nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and exclusion of vertebrate herbivores from the no nutrients and the all nutrients plots. So three blocks, each of about 200 meters square. And if you're interested in that, get in touch with Elizabeth Bora at the University of Minnesota. That's her, that's her contact um, website. The other one is a, is a project called BugNet. Um, it's a factorial exclusion of insects, mollusks, and fungal herbivores. They get roughly the same size, three replicates each of 200 meters. And that's run out of the University of Bern by Eric Allen. So if, you, if you're interested in what you see today, follow up on those two uh, sets of experiments. They're really interesting and complementary to what we're finding out at Silwood. The other big experiment at Silwood, which is new, is, are the aquatic mesocosms. Guy Woodward's work on the impacts of warming on freshwater ecosystems. And you should follow that up if you're interested in that aspect. So, Silwood experiments. Most of our long-term work is observational rather than experimental. So, let me show you quickly two of the longest and most interesting time series. The first one involves Quercus roba and its herbivores. So, here's a graph on the y-axis are the number of acorns per shoot averaged over 30 oak trees. And the time series goes from 1979 up to the present. And what you see here is that, roughly speaking, acorns are produced on a two-year cycle with occasional phase shifts. But the interesting point, I think, is that the variance in acorn crop is clearly increasing. So last year, the extreme right-hand point was the lowest acorn crop we've ever seen. And the year before that, 2020, was by far the biggest acorn crop we've ever seen. And although we don't do the field work until late July, it's clear that 2022 is going to be a huge acorn crop again. So this two-year cycle is a, is a clearly a continuing pattern. Now, the major herbivore killing acorns in Silwood it's this fine fellow called Andicus quercus callosus, the nopagol insect. It's a cynipid gall wasp. And generally speaking, the formation of the gall kills the acorn by kicking it out, poopoo-like, as it were, from the acorn cup. And the interesting question is whether that alternate bearing cycle has anything to do with protection from these very high rates of predation by invertebrates. And the data are very convincing, yes. If you look at the left-hand side of this graph, which has the proportion of uh, acorns killed by nopagols on the y-axis. You can see that when the acorn crop is small on the left-hand side, very, very high rates of mortality are inflicted by these insects, from 80% upwards to as high as 98% in different years. And remember that these nopagols are eating the acorns before all the other guys who eat them get a chance. The jays, the squirrels, the wood mice, they're all picking up what these nopagols leave behind. And then look at the right-hand side of the graph, where acorn crop is high, the nopagols are taking under 20%, under leaving lots of acorns for the other acorn-feeding animals, and also, of course, for oak recruitment from seeds. So this alternate bearing does appear to lead to predator satiation and therefore to protection of the, uh, the recruitment of the trees. The other really long-term system is cinnabar moth on ragwort. So this graph shows ragwort abundance. This is the number of flowering stems in a 10-meter square from 1980 onwards. And again, you see massive fluctuation, but no increasing trend as far as we can see in variance. But if you look at the extreme right-hand side of that time series, from 2020 onwards, we basically haven't got any ragwort on the study plots. And I've just done the work for 2022, and although it's increasing slightly, it's still basically gone from our study plots. So this is what Silwood looks like in what we call a ragwort year, when you're getting upwards of 10 flowering stems per meter squared 
And this is what that same site looks like this year. The ragwort is coming back. You can see some ragwort plants there. The year before, this was a ragwort-free view. And here are the cinnabar moths, again, fluctuating massively. And again, if you concentrate on the extreme right-hand side there, you'll see that from 2020 onwards, we've virtually had no cinnabar moths. And again, this year's fieldwork shows no cinnabar moths. So in a big cinnabar year, this is what their impact looks like. The eggs are laid in batches, so the herbivory on a plant receiving an egg batch is extremely high, and almost always a plant with an egg batch will be stripped completely of all of its flowers, and the caterpillars will have to move, migrate across the grassland to find plants that haven't been completely defoliated to complete their um, development up to pupation. The interesting thing about the dynamics is that Ragwort normally would be a biennial plant, and it would be killed by setting a full crop of seeds. What cinnabar moths do is they prevent the formation of a full crop of seeds, and so they actually reduce the death rate. So being eaten by cinnabar moth causes the plant to live and not to die. And that's counterintuitively why cinnabar moth is the most often failed with agent of biocontrol. It looks like it's a great agent because it strips the plants completely, but it's actually reducing their death rate. And obviously that's not what you want in a biocontrol agent. So the, I'll just mention quickly some other observational studies in case you're interested in following these up. The Rotham said suction trap samples principally aphids, but also uh, minute parasitoids. It's been running since 1968. The rabbit work's been going on since 79 and continues. We have a white and wood-like um, blue tit survey started by Ian Owens in 2002 and still going on. And uh, Aurelio Malo started studying the wood mice in Nash's Cops in 2008. So let's get to the Nash's Field experiment, the, the, the meat of this talk. Nash's Field was inspired by the famous park grass experiment at Rothamsted, where we gathered data for 10 consecutive years, 1991 to 2000 using six replicate sorted biomass samples, 50 by 25 centimeters from each of the 89 plots every year. A massive, massive logistical effort. So this is what park grass experiment looks like. It has the distinction of being the longest running experiment in ecology in the world. It started three years before Darwin finally got around to publishing the origin of the species. So it's been going since 1856, more than 150 years. And what I want you to look at carefully is how sharp the boundaries are between the plots, other than the mown parts, which of course have sharp boundaries. The nutrients are applied in horizontal strips from the bottom of the slide to the top. It's testimony to the care of the um, farm workers at Rotham said that they've applied these uh, nutrients so precisely over such a long time. But the ecological point is that this experiment shows to us very clearly that added nutrients don't move laterally in soils. But that's, that's a big deal, and this is a very clear finding in the park grass experiment. It enables us, too, at Silwood to have relatively small plots for our nutrient additions, because there isn't this lateral movement. So let's just rehearse the famous results from Rothamsted. First of all, the key textbook result is the relationship between plant species richness and total plant biomass. So here it is. It's a very highly significant negative relationship between species richness and biomass. But there's a huge scatter. There's clearly lots of other stuff going on here. What about species richness and soil pH? Well, again, it's very highly significant, but clearly not linear. If you look in the bottom left-hand corner for the low pH, all of those data points are below the line. All of the residuals are negative. So this clearly is a non-linear relationship. So what we should do really is add these two factors together, show them simultaneously using analysis of covariance. And as usual with ANCOVAR, it shows the results much more clearly. So here we are. Species richness on the y-axis, total plant biomass on the x-axis, high pH plots in blue, and low pH plots in red. And it's very clear that low pH reduces plant species richness, but it also reduces the importance of biomass as a determinant of lowered species richness. So you get a very clear negative relationship on the high pH points. The higher the biomass, the lower the species richness. 
But what about which plants they are? To do that, we have to look at all the sorted biomass samples, all of the, the weights from all the species in all the years. And a byplot from a principal components analysis is a useful way of looking at this. So here it is. It's a complicated picture, like all multivariate statistics. But if you look at the first principal component, the x-axis, if you look at the right-hand side, you can see the initials of the dominant plants. So AP is Allopectus picturus, AE is Aranathomalaceus, HS, Heraclean spondylium. They're the, they're the big plants which form a very high biomass community. So the right-hand end of that principal component axis one is clearly high biomass. If you look at the left-hand side of the picture, you're seeing letters like LH, Leontodon hispidus, BM, Brisa media, LC, Lotus paniculatus. These are low biomass plants. So it's pretty clear that that PC1 is an axis of increasing biomass from right to left. What about the vertical axis? Well, at the top, you'll see AC and AO, Agrostis capillaris and Anthoxanthum odoratum, acid grassland specialists. And then at the bottom, you see TF, Tracid and Flavicens, Plantega lanceolata, Ronto's acris, high pH species. So the vertical part of this, the second principal component, is pretty clearly an axis of soil pH. So this identity picture backs up the story we looked at with those other two slides. The key features here are biomass, determined in park grass by the addition of nitrogen and phosphorus together, and soil acidity. Interestingly, as affected at Rotham said, by the kind of nitrogen that was used. So the most acid plots but ammonium sulfate is their nitrogen source, and that, of course, is highly acidifying. So this is what Nash's field at Silwood looked like before we put the Nash's field experiment into it. It was a hay field till 1991, and here it is in 1998 after the experiment had been set up for um, six years or so. You see plots of different sizes with the relatively large rabbit fences um, in, in big squares next to adjacent rabbit grazed plots with the same uh, combination of treatments. So the central question of Nash's field, how does herbivory interact with nutrient supply to affect the richness and community composition of these grasses? So it's sort of Rothamsted plus herbivores. So the, here's the design. It's a press experiment. So these treatments are added every year. We've got 12 nutrients in combination, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium. Not all 16 combinations of the full factorial design, because that would have taken up too much space. Then we have plus and minus lime, again like a roughing state. So the new bits are plus and minus rabbits, which is managed by fencing, plus and minus mollusks, which is managed by applying metaldehyde pellets, now illegal, of course. And plus and minus insects is managed by using a cocktail of systemic insecticides plus knockdown pesticides. And again, Sod's Law is working here. All of the insecticides that were used at the beginning of the experiment are now illegal. The plot sizes differ. It's a split plot experiment. So the small plots, using that information that we got from park grass on minimal lateral flow of nutrients, are small. They're two by two. The line plots are 12 by four. The rabbit fences are 16 by 12, and plus and minus mollusks and plus and minus insects, where we might expect the herbivores to move about a lot and to recolonize quite quickly if we had small plots following uh, exclusion, are much bigger. So again, just to point out the role of Nash's field in the design, uh, the rabbits in the design of Nash's field, this picture shows um, in the foreground plus rabbits. In the middle distance, you can see the rabbit fence that's minus rabbits, but there are no trees in it. And in the distance, you can see a plot that was erected in 1996 to show what would happen if we fenced the rabbits out but didn't cut the grass every year. So th there's a closed canopy woodland in the distance, which is how the central plot would have looked had we not mown it every year. So the minus rabbits plot are actually cut once a year in um, late July, August time. So when rabbits were abundant, this is what Silwood Nash's field looked like. And here it is this year. You, you can basically see that the rabbit fence effect has disappeared almost entirely. There is an interesting residual D 
detail about rabbits though if you add nitrogen on its own rather than nitrogen and phosphorus together you don't get much change in botanical composition the agrostis and fastuca still dominate but they take up the nitrogen and become much more attractive to the herbivores so if you add nitrogen on its own inside a rabbit fence the biomass goes up as you'd expect if you add just nitrogen outside a fence the biomass goes down because the rabbits congregate on these nutrient-rich hotspots and this is what happens in the center of the picture you see two adjacent plots that have been grazed down almost to a billiard table by the rabbits they getting nitrogen on their own the adjacent plots with much longer grass were getting um, phosphorus potassium and magnesium but not nitrogen so the take-home message about the insect part of Nash's field was that the most influential taxa turn out to be the grass-feeding homoptera, and excluding insect herbivores leads to reduced plant species richness. How does that work? Well, the increased grass growth following um, insect exclusion leads to competitive exclusion of the low-growing herbs. So basically, the grass gets longer and the low-growing species disappear. The mollusks, on the other hand, if you exclude the slugs and the snails, you get increased plant species richness. How does that work? That's because the mollusks feed selectively on the seedlings of the low-growing herbs. So increased plant species richness results from reduced seedling predation, leading to increased plant recruitment. So the principal finding of that part is that different invertebrate herbivores have opposite effects. I mean, we're used to different groups of animals having different effects, but here we've got a wonderfully extreme example where the insects and the mollusks have actually opposite effects. Insects increase diversity by reducing interspecific plant competition, and mollusks reduce plant diversity, mollusks increase plant diversity by increased mortality. I'm oh, sorry, I'll start that again. Mollusks reduce plant diversity by increasing mortality of low growing herbs. So the other part of Nash's field wasn't a press experiment. It was a couple of different pulse experiments. That's to say experiments that are done once and then followed as they, their effects um, either decline or amplify. So there were three selective herbicide treatments, minus grass, minus herbs and control, and seed addition or not, 62 species that weren't in Silwood were sown on the plus magnesium and minus magnesium plots because by the time we did this, we realized there was essentially no difference between just adding magnesium and having control or just having everything but magnesium and having N, P, and K together. So what do I mean by seed limitation? Seed limitation is demonstrated experimentally, and the only way you can actually assess seed limitation is by sowing extra seeds. Recruitment is seed limited if this leads to higher plant densities during the next time period. Recruitment's not seed limited if the seeds are either eaten or destroyed by their enemies, by the granivores, or there are no suitable sites for recruitment, which we call microsite limitation. So out of those 62 species, only two proved to be seed limited, and they weren't generally seed limited. Both Centauri de Boxii and Heraclean swandilium were seed limited, but only inside the fences, and much more frequently on those plots inside the fences that were lined than were unlined. So here's the, uh, the knapweed, massive increase in cover on the fenced plots that were lined. And here's Heraclean, even bigger cover and even more pronounced effect of liming. So the upshot of this is, if you go into Nash's field now and look outside the fences, you won't find Centauria or Heraclean. And that might lead you to assume that they were limited by dispersal, that they were, there was no reign of Heraclean or Centauria. But of course, that's effect caused by rabbit grazing. So selective elimination of species by, uh, by rabbits gives the impression, a false impression in this case, of dispersal limitation. You can only demonstrate that uh, the situation is as it is by doing the experiment, coupling rabbit exclusion with seed addition. So let me show you the results of the other 
pulse experiment, which was reducing interspecific competition by adding either a grass-specific herbicide or a herb-specific herbicide. So the grass-specific herbicide allowed a mass expansion of otherwise suppressed herbs like um, Veronica, Vichia, and so forth. And here's a picture of a plot. This is a minus grass treatment. You can see there's virtually no blades of grass showing in it. It's dominated almost entirely by Veronica camigris with a smattering of ranunculus repens. So that's a really spectacular demonstration of the interspecific competition normally subjected by common these herbs by the dominant grasses. The converse experiment where you eliminate the herbs and ask what happens to the grasses is you get a very modest increase in grass biome. So it's strongly asymmetric competition here between the herbs and the grasses. But one of the joys of doing these experiments is you get some highly unexpected effects. Perhaps the most unexpected was that the grass selective herbicide actually benefited the grass Festuca rubra. So here's the abundance of Festuca in the minus grass treatment in the middle in green compared with the control plots in red and the minus herb pots in blue. So what's going on here is it's probably a, a function of the nature of the leaves of Festuca rubra. They're very wiry and very waxy and it's probable that the um, spray applied herbicide just didn't stick to them. But clearly, Festuca rubra in the original sward was suffering considerably from interspecific plant competition from the other grasses that were susceptible to the herbicide. The other lesson that we've learned is that big effects can take a very long time to appear. Uh, by a very long time, I mean the duration of multiple consecutive PhDs. So let's just look at one of these really big effects that happened in Nash's field. It involved the replacement of species-rich grass and with 15 or so species that looks basically like this, with what's essentially a monoculture of Urtica dioica, nettles, with gallium aparini cleavers growing up inside it, which looks like this. It's an absolutely spectacular reduction in plant species richness. Now, interestingly and importantly, this effect the, the invasion of Urtica was a four-way interaction. It required rabbit grazing to be present and rabbit disturbance. On, so it was on the unfenced plots only. It only worked on the plots that were lined. It only worked on plots that had nitrogen added to them, but also phosphorus at the same time. So both N and P together, that combination which at Rothamsted produced the very highest biomass. And it was independent of insecticide or mollusk exclusion. So let's just recap those lessons learned from Nash's field. The first one is we don't typically run our experiments for long enough. That Urtica effect took 15 years first to appear in the results and 18 years before it became significant. The other really crucial thing that Nash's field teaches us is that effect sizes change with time. So if you do the sort of the Gregor Mendel thing and you publish your results as soon as they become significant and that's it, you might be led to believe that effect sizes in ecology are sort of some sort of constants that are estimated once and for all. But of course this is nonsense. As soon as you start to think about it, you realize there must be massive year effects due to weather. There must be successional effects caused by the experimental applications having long-term effects that alter interactions between the species that are present and of course the species that are there are evolving not least because of the experimental treatments that you're adding the other thing that park grass and rothamsted both do is to emphasize the added value you get from doing factorial experiments where you add multiple different kinds of treatments in combinations to allow you to estimate interaction effects so just to remind you, that huge Urtica effect was a four-way interaction. We would never have discovered that effect had we been doing effects of just fencing or just nitrogen addition. So let's move on to the second ECT experiment at Silver. This is called the Pound Hill Disturbance Timing Experiment. And this is the picture of it taken from the sky just after the May cultivation treatments had been done. And you can see the big broad stripes caused by the four 
um, cultivation treatments expertly done by Pete Wilkinson, who's one of our audience today, I suspect. So the central question for Pound Hill was this, how does the timing of soil disturbance affect plant community composition? This, this community had been a wheat field, a weedy wheat field, and we simply abandoned it so that the seed bank of weeds was uniform essentially across the whole field. There are three timing treatments, October cultivation, March cultivation, and May cultivation, and four replicates of each independently randomized. This is what a map of it looks like. So you see the plots are long and thin to make cultivation easy. The different color codes, the yellow, show you the independently randomized October cultivation treatments, blue for March and gray for May. And visually, the effects are huge. So you can see that relatively sharp line separating the left from the right. On the left, you see a mass of raffinus and papava. On the right, you see a mass of non-flowering plants that have been cultivated later. So on the left, you see the results of October cultivation, and on the right, March. So I'm going to show you some results tables, and they're, they're very detailed. So we want to look at the content, just the identity, which is the top species. So which plant species is dominating this treatment? and which plant species are restricted to this timing treatment, shown by three asterisks. So these data are cover in four blocks with mean cover and frequency. So here's the October results. And you see the October plots are dominated by the rhizomatistras holcus mollis. And some very abundant species are confined entirely to these October plots, bulked by Maioros, which is becoming a weed of winter wheat, Aaron area, Leptoclados, and so on. Lots and lots of species, but completely restricted to October cultivation. March plots are dominated by completely different plants. It's a herb, it's Artemisia vulgaris. Species confined to the March plots include Medicargo, Polygonum aviculari, Sisimbrium, Matricaria, and annual, annual crop weeds. Restricted completely to the March cultivation. May cultivation is adopted by and dominated by across this gigantia with things like Gallinsoca parviflora, Lamia plexicoli, beautiful weed, and so on, as species restricted to these treatments. So a good question is how consistent are these treatments across the replicates? And a good way of looking at that, which takes all the data into account, all the cover values of all the species, is by hierarchical cluster analysis. And when we do that, ideally, the replicates would cluster together. So replicates 1 to 4 would be the October cultivations, 5 to 8 would be the March cultivations, and 9 to 12 would be the May cultivations. So the replicates would cluster, but the treatment should be separated in an ideal world. And Sod's law actually is not working here because this is an ideal world. Look, here's the hierarchical cluster analysis. And you see on the left there, the long limb descending to plus one to four, they're the October replicates. And on the right-hand side, you see the March replicates, five to eight. And then in the middle, you see the May replicates, nine to 12. So th this is quite extraordinary. This is, this is ecology um, as you don't expect it normally to be. So what are the lessons from Pound Hill Field? The, the biggest message, obviously, is that timing matters. And the corollary of that, I think, is that experiments should really involve multiple timings for each of your applications. So if you're doing something as a treatment, like, for example, spraying insecticide, you should do it at different times. The other thing that I think is very clear is that the whole experiment should be started anew in multiple years. Rather than just starting at once and seeing what happens, it's entirely reasonable that what happened in that first year you began was completely um, idiosyncratic that had to do with the conditions specific to that year. So overall then, what, what have these Silwood experiments told us? I think that the, the big message is that long-term field experiments give us, a, if you like, a different kind of truth to theory or observation. Theory tells us quite unequivocally what would happen if the assumptions were true. But of course, that's a pretty big if. Observation tells us what happened, 
but of course we've no idea why it happened. And the great thing about manipulative field experiments is we know what happened and we also know why it happened. So the other thing about factorial field experiments is they're super efficient in terms of statistical design and finding out the possibility of high order interactions. They're much more efficient than single factor experiments. This is depressing news, I know, but transient dynamics can last much longer than most PhD studies. So if a PhD student has the misfortune to have to start an experiment themselves, they'll probably end up writing it up before they know that the transients have damped away. And lastly, big effects can take literally decades to appear and longer than that to become statistically significant. So many thanks to ECT for their support and thanks to you for listening.